Hi, yeah, my name is Dave Schmoody. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit today about Jack Trammell and what he accomplished in his life and uh, particularly like where he's coming from as someone that was a really important part of the personal computer revolution and a pretty misunderstood figure, I think, um, during the whole time. So uh, where I'm coming from is I've been working and researching on a documentary for the last five years called Jack and the Machine, which parallels the life and times of Jack Trammell with the uh, personal computer revolution. And we have uh, collected uh, amassed quite a bit of unique and independent research, uh, including um, his Hall Earth ID number uh, when he was interned in, in Wudge. And I'll get a little bit into his backstory. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with it, so I won't spend too much time, and I'll get to the meat and potatoes. But the documentary, uh, real quick, um, is online as a teaser page. We have an 80-second video, jackinthemachine.com. And right now, we're in this stage of just kind of looking for email signups and people that are interested in some of the topics we cover. We release a lot of essays and videos and research as we go along uh, with different publishing partners. Um, so essays in, about um, interoperability and, and, and data encoding, things like that. We also have released um, some primary research on Jack Trammell that's pretty unique. And we continue to release as we um, release things like uh, this essay on Alan Kay, for example, and Steve Jobs. And we continue to release as we build out the documentary, which is some of you who have worked in media know is quite a undertaking. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, the other part of this is, uh, this talk is about hackers. And um, that's also, of course, a pretty misunderstood uh, group of people. Um, there's a, just looking at the floor here, there are a number of hackers definitely out there that are just doing some amazing work uh, repurposing vintage computers. And then their, um, their lineage, of course, goes back a long time. Uh, a lot of you have probably read Steve Levy's book or have maybe even been involved with the uh, mainframe era or the, micro or the mini computer era where a lot of these hacker ethics were established. And so what I want to do is I want to look at these com community values that are part of the hacker ethic and kind of parallel it with Jack Trammell. So these, you know, it's never been really codified, but these are some of the important ones to me. Uh, Hands-on imperative, meaning the hacker ethic says that it's really important that you are able to tinker, you are able to get your hands on and dissect and figure out how things work, how, system works, how systems work. Uh, decentralization is bigger than bureaucracy, or is greater than bureaucracy, meaning that the push to decentralize, the push against bureaucracy is part of the hacker ethic, I think. Uh, bureaucracy gets in the way of personal progress, of understanding a system. Uh, the idea that information should be free. Of course, Richard Stallman is a big proponent of that, a very famous proponent today. Uh, unrestricted access to computers, uh, which is less an issue now, but still, like, there are all sorts of restrictions. I mean, we all have access to computers now, unlike it was when, there was, when many computers ruled the world. But we're, we do have quite restricted access, and they're always hacking and breaking down those barriers. barriers. And the idea that computers can change lives for the better. So this idea, those ideas kind of came into the forefront of popular culture in the 1980s, and they're carried on the back of uh, personal computers. So a lot of these hacker ethics from Cambridge and from the Bay Area were brought in uh, to the home via the home computer. Uh, this ad by Apple um, is kind of like a really interesting historical artifact that shows what the people were thinking at the time. Uh, just reading these highlighted parts, they, they say in this ad, this is you know, uh, released around 1981, 1982, welcome IBM, when we, being Apple, invented the first personal computer system. So that's kind of remarkable, where Apple's publicly taking credit for inventing the personal computer. right? Um, not only were they inventing the first personal computer system, if we look down here, is they are, what they are doing is increasing social capital by enhancing individual productivity. So Apple 
is buying an ad in 1981 and telling everybody is not only did they invent the PC, but they also are the people that are increasing social capital by enhancing individual productivity. Uh, computers, can take, computers can make lives better. You know? That's the whole idea that Apple's promoting there. But the problem with what was happening in home computers at the time is unlike many computers and some of the uh, later mainframes, where there is a community effort to keep these computers running and people were sharing code, corporate values co sort of interceded that ethic, right? And it made it difficult to achieve some of these things. Like, for example, information should be free. Well, corporations don't necessarily think information should be free. They don't think software should be free, for example. And corporate values also outline, of course, winners and losers, right? The winners are the people that wrote the history. The winners are the people that sell the most product. Now, hacking principles aren't necessarily about selling product. But when the PC became the hottest um, market in the early 1980s, well, uh, winners and losers in selling product those went hand in hand. And so a winner might be Steve Wozniak, a winner might be Bill Gates, a loser might be Lee Felsenstein, who uh, before Wozniak you know, put together the process of technology, Sal, he uh, put together the Adam Osborne, these machines that didn't quite make it, right? Or Dan Bricklin, who of course might have been a winner uh, by inventing VisiCalc. I mean, he's a hacker, he put together VisiCalc, you know, the, the, the the killer app for the Apple II. But essentially, he's a loser because um, by 1983, he's out of business, right? So winners and losers um, are sort of outlined and necessitated by um, free market. And the thing about all those people, though, on the previous slide, Lee Felsenstein, Steve Wozniak, Dan Brinklin, Bill Gates, those, those people were definitely hackers. Right? As in, they came out of technology, they grew up with technology, they understood technology, they were at the very least engineers, no doubt. Right? Um, and the thing that's interesting to me about Jack Trammell is he is this footnote in the entire, in the entire arc of the personal computer, um, or nearly a footnote, um, but he had a huge impact, an outsized impact, and he was, an, by any measure, an outsider. And when you look at the history of this Polish immigrant with a fourth grade education, who was not an engineer, and honestly um, didn't really understand the technical merits of, a, of like understand how to hack together a computer, right? When you look at what he accomplished, he outlasted um, the brightest minds, many of the brightest minds from Cambridge, many of the brightest minds uh, or I should say maybe Boston area, many of the brightest minds in the Bay Area, like MITS, processor technology, right? He outlasted Texas Instruments in the home computer war. And these are companies or, that either were stocked with brilliant engineers or they're companies that were stocked with brilliant engineers and incredible capital, like Texas Instruments. Um, brilliant engineers like uh, Sinclair. Um, lots of capital, like Atari which he eventually bought, right? And so this guy that doesn't really have a lot in common with the list of people that work at these companies, and he doesn't really have an understanding in the same way of the machines that he's selling, managed to put him out of business, managed to outlast him, and that's the part about Jack that I found so interesting. So um, rewinding a bit and learning, just talking really quick about Jack and how he got where he was, because a lot of the biography of Jack is about how he's an Auschwitz survivor that found a Commodore. And of course, Commodore eventually released the Commodore 64, right? And when you read that bio bi biography, or at least when I read that biography, I was like, whoa, 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 wait. You don't just like get out of Auschwitz in, um, in 1945 and then you know, invent, or sorry, market the Commodore 64 in 1982. There's a middle part to that that's kind of missing in this biography. So digging a little deeper, um, those holes can, those gaps can be filled. And um, first of all, uh, one of the most important things about Jack, who was born in Wudge, Poland, um, 
and was 11 in 39 when the Nazis invaded. One of the most important things about Jack's journey is the fact, of course, that uh, he wasn't at Auschwitz very long. Um, the thing was, he was moved over to Alem pretty quickly, within, he only spent two or three months, actually, uh, by the records I've been able to find at Auschwitz. And it's incredibly important because, of course, if he would have been kept at Auschwitz, the so he would have been on the Soviet side. But he was moved into Alem, so he's liberated by American infantry. Okay? So he ended up on the American side in the Cold War, which, of course, has massive reper uh, reper repercussions. And one of the significant parts about his story, too, is that he was um, born in Łódź, Poland. And Łódź was a very significant um, uh, uh, city for the, Nazi, uh, for the Nazis because what they were doing in Łódź before the Nazis came in is they were, uh, they were a, a textile center. And so once the Nazis took it over, they were able to turn that textile center into uh, a, slave, uh, a, a, a center of slave labor so that they could produce Nazi uniforms and boots and things like that, stuff that you need when you're fighting a war, right? And so Jack actually spent most of his time during the war um, <coughs> enslaved and making, um, uh, being essentially a tailor of, 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 of the Third Reich, right? And then he was moved in 1944 to Auschwitz as they liquidated, um, as they liquidated the ghetto in Łódź as the Soviets came in, and then within three months, he was sent deeper into Germany, into Alam. So that's how he got to the West to begin with. And then from 1945 to 1947, he was in Germany, but quickly ended up in New York City, which is also another pretty incredible accomplishment we'll look at a little bit deeper um, in a bit. And he ended up in New York only to enlist in the United States Army, so then he went down to Fort Dix, where it's part of his biography that a lot of people talk about, he learned how to repair typewriters in the U.S. Army, and eventually ended up in Toronto, where he did found Commodore as a typewriter uh, company. And so this is an early logo on the back of one of the typewriters. And you can see the, the Commodore font, you know, significantly different. Uh, the maple leaf right there, and as part, as, the logo, as part of the logo, and it says Made in Canada at the bottom. But typewriters don't get us to the personal computer very quickly. I mean, of course, they both have keyboards, but that's, um, that's not enough. So in the 1960s, um, Jack's world continues to expand. And he ends up uh, going back to Berlin. And of course, if you know anything about Commodore and you know anything about Atari Corp, you know that a major part of their market was Europe, uh, United Kingdom, uh, also including Germany was an important market, well, West Germany specifically, for Jack Trammell. And that started really in the 1960s. And without getting into too much detail, Jack eventually bought an adding machine factory in Berlin, in West Berlin. And on the left, you see a Commodore adding machine. And uh, on the right, you see a Fila adding machine. And you can tell that they're the same adding machine. And so what he was able to do is buy essentially and we'll talk more about that in detail, how he did that. But buy an adding machine factory, repurpose it, call it a Commodore, and bring it in to the West. Okay? So fly it out of the, the deep outpost of uh, Berlin in East Germany and fly it into the West. And then in the 70s, his world expanded even further. And he ended up going to Japan in the Far East. And that's when, of course, he gets into digital equipment. So from typewriters to adding machines and now to actual uh, digital electronics. And one of the things that in this early Mr. Calculator ad that I wanted to highlight, Mr. Calculator was a small chain of shops that he set up to sell calculators because uh, he was having trouble competing, of course, with Radio Shack and these and the inroads that these other uh, companies had uh, for distribution. Um, and it says here, at last, an advanced classroom calculator for every student. And it actually says, an advanced ca classroom calculator every student can afford. Um, and this idea of a calculator that every student can afford okay, is a very important part 
of who he became as a computer pioneer. So here's where I'm going to make a bit of a leap now. And Jack Tramiel was not an engineer. But my argument here is that within Jack's uh, biography, we can see a bit of the hacker ethic with how he, um, how he ran his life. And that's kind of important because, again, the Commodore 64 is the best-selling computer of all time, supposedly, regardless of the validity of that statement, he sold a lot of computers and stood, stayed around a long time. And a lot of hackers, okay, uh, like um, Linus Torvalds or Julian Assange, or, uh, dozens and dozens of hackers do say that they got their start on Commodore computers. And there's something within the machine itself, like a lot of people talk about it with Wozniak's machine, the Apple II being a great hacker computer because it was designed to be open and all this other stuff. But there, these machines, and I think a lot of you would agree, they carry the culture of those people or the ideas of those people that created them, right? And so the fact that Jack made machines, even though he wasn't an engineer, even though he wasn't a hacker, but that were appealing to engineers and appealing to hackers, um, there's got to be a connection there in my mind. So, first of all, hacker ethic. So part of it is just uh, social engineering, kind of hacking the system, getting what you want. Jack Tramiel, if you look up his biography, he has, at the very minimum, two birthdays, right? And it's pretty easily explainable, but the fact that his birthday is listed alternatively as 1928, as 1927, I've also seen different months I've also seen different years. I've seen 1929, right? It has a lot to do with how he got to the United States. This is his log. Uh, this is not his log. This is the log of the Marine Flasher, the log that came into um, Ellis Island. And um, here's Jack Tramiel. First of all, it's spelled T-R-A-M-I-E-L here. It was actually, of course, originally, as far as we can tell, T-R-Z-M-I-E-L. His name isn't Jack here, it's Edek, Edek Tramel. Edek is uh, slang for little Yuda, Yuda, Jude, Judah, Jack, okay? He had several different names, he had a couple different nicknames, so he's kind of hard to trace. And that wasn't so much the hacking. The hacking part was the idea of the two birthdays. So he tells a story about coming to America because um, Getting to America after World War II was not easy, even for Jewish survivors, because there were quotas, there was lines, there were lines. A lot of people wanted to come here. And um, so he definitely wanted to come over because, not because he had some idea he was going to start a computer revolution. He wanted to come over because uh, he got married after 45 to um, another uh, actual survivor at the camps. And she had family in Chicago, and she had an inn to come over. And so his wife was coming over, so Jack said, oh, okay, well, I'll go to America with you. And he goes up to HAIC or some of the other immigration um, aides uh, over in West Germany at the time. And when he tells the story, because it's kind of astonishing he got over here so fast, it only took him a couple months to get over here. Um, one of the parts of the story is the immigration officer says, well, so first of all, how old are you? And Jack says, well, how old do I need to be in order to get over there? And well, you can't come over if you're 17 because you need you know, an adult and all this other stuff. So he says, OK, well, I'm 18. You know, and he, he advances birthday year. And that's the reason why he has, of course, two birthdays. Okay? But he was, as he put it in the story, he doesn't figure out why he cannot do things. He figures out why he can do things, right? which is pretty hackerish. The hands-on imperative, okay? That's one of the principles I talked about earlier. This idea that you can tinker with things, systems, you can take things apart, put it together. Jack got to start uh, repairing typewriters in the US Army. And then um, he knew a little bit about typewriters. Maybe he wasn't the greatest um, hands-on engineer, but he could repair typewriters. He ends up in the Bronx repairing some typewriters for a while. Not a lot of money. There's a whole like backstory to that too. Not a lot of money in repairing typewriters. He ends up in Canada, okay? He ends up in Toronto as we talked about. And through a connection, he ends up 
in, a, in the room with Sears. And Sears, um, at the time, of course, a lot of you know, for example, the way Sears used to work, uh, maybe with the Atari VCS, they had their own brand for the, you know, the, the Atari system, the telegame system. They had the same thing with typewriters. They had a tower computers brand, or tower typewriters brand. And what they wanted was a cheap typewriter to sell in their stores. And so Jack gets in front of them, and they said, well, we need some typewriters. You, um, I guess, repair typewriters. You've sold, repaired and sold lots of typewriters. Can you manufacture typewriters? And he said, yes, I can manufacture typewriters. And then, of course, in the interview, he admits that he has n had no idea how to manufacture a typewriter at the time. He just said, yes, and I'll figure it out. You know? And um, it was pretty sketchy for a while, of course, for him. He did eventually, because all the established ma typewriter manufacturers, um, like Everest or Oliveretti or whatever, those guys uh, didn't want to deal with some small guy like Jack. He eventually found a source, as far as I can tell, he found a source um, in Czechoslovakia at the time and was able then to have them manufacture a low-cost typewriter. He Im imports it. Um, Jack was never the most, a lot of people know about his reputation, not necessarily being the most scrupulous businessman. Um, of course, ta put a tag on it that says it's made in Canada, although most evidence suggests that the typewriters that were imported were assembled in, the, in Eastern Europe. And so therefore, they were pretty cheap, and it's exactly what Sears needed. And that's actually what started Commodore for the guy. He had that first manufacturing um, contact in check. He was able to get a price point. He was able to get into Sears stores, and that was, that was him. But it started by saying yes, even though he didn't know the answer. He just said yes, right, and figured it out. Um, another thing we talked about earlier was the idea and the ethic about decentralization being, um, being a priority over bureaucracy. So how can we decentralize our systems? And um, even our management systems. That's why a lot of hackers, of course, didn't necessarily bode well in business, because eventually businesses need proper management structures, right? Jack never really had a proper management structure. Um, for example, this picture is him. It's a pretty well-known picture. That's him and his three sons after he bought Atari Corp. And um, he just installed his sons sort of in the positions where he wanted to at Atari Corp. His management style is pretty controversial. There's, uh, Bill Hurd was here yesterday. He really loved working for Jack, as far as I can tell. Um, a lot of people didn't. For example, this quote. Uh, this is James, uh, James Finke talking about Jack Trammell. He is a boss, not a manager. Remember Machiavelli? The strongest kingdom had the strongest barons and the strong king. There are no strong barons in Jack's kingdoms. There is only a strong king. So this idea of Jack being an autocratic manager, a micromanager, right? Part of uh, what happened in 84 when he was booted out of Commodore was there was a lot of, um, lot of chatter about his management style, if that was the thing that got him booted, ultimately. And um, you know, there's been a lot of stuff that's gone around over the years. Leonard Trammell has recently talked about perhaps why Jack and Commodore eventually split in 1984. But, the bottom line is, is that his management style was either autocratic, right, depending on who you ask, or it was family. And it was very flat. So part of the problem with Commodore at the time in 84 was he, did, he, would, he would chew through upper management, just constantly wheel through them. And he just had, he just, when he needed to get something done, he wouldn't necessarily go through management he would go to the person to get the thing done. So he would, have, he would, interfere, he would interface quite directly with engineers quite often, you know, like Bill Hurd yesterday, or Chuck Peddle, or whomever he was working with. A lot of them uh, would interface directly with Jack, which sounds quite a bit like a Silicon Valley startup sort of situation, the way that Steve Jobs interfaced, uh, not necessarily entirely with upper management, or Bill Gates when they started up, when they were smaller, and they were interfacing with whoever they needed to on, on this, uh, I guess, bureaucratic ladder, except for, to their eyes, like a Jobs or a 
or Tremel, it was pretty flat, right? People might have positions vertically, but they thought about the they thought about the um, they thought about the st organizational structure of their companies pretty flat. So Jack, after he's booted in '84, said, "I'm not a professional executive. I use a personal touch, like a family business. I never believed I would be able to run a company the size of Commodore." This is '84. Jack had turned Commodore into a billion dollar a year company, and that's what he said. Uh, to Fortune magazine in January of that year after he had been booted. So he has this pretty peculiar, as, as a guy that heads a billion dollar company, pretty peculiar uh, thought about, um, about what a company should be and how it should be structured, which is part of the reason people suggest that he was, he was uh, kicked out of Commodore. This idea that information should be free. I brought a couple of video clips here of Jack in his own words. Because part of the important, for me, part of the important uh, part of being a documentarian is trying to balance the idea of individual authorship and then also, like me as a person in 2016, and also allowing the subjects to be able to speak for themselves. So that's so why I'm using these quotes. And I'll look at this video clip real quick with you and show you, for example, the way that Jack, for example, thought about um, the individual use of a computer. We uh, in Atari uh, believe very much that we are manufacturing products for personal use. We call it personal computers. When I started the personal computer business in 1976, we call it a personal computer, and I'm still continuing. Now, it's up to the individual where he wants to carry this computer to. Mm -hmm. He can have it in his, in his home, and he can have it in his office, he can have it in the lab, anywhere. But it's up to him. I do not dictate to him where he's going to take it to. So just as Jack wasn't um, an engineer, he wasn't a hacker. And so Jack didn't go around like Richard Stallman and saying, well, information should be free and whatnot. But Jack was not exactly the most uh, private individual when it came to, uh, or sorry, intellectual property sort of... Um, um, uh, you didn't run an intellectual property fife thumb like, like someone like Bill Gates or whatever, where he, um, he didn't really have a strong opinion on copy protection for software, right? He uh, was pretty loose with intellectual property. He used it as a leveraging point for negotiations, right? But he was also, for example, um, Bill Minch with the Western Design Center. That's the person that ultimately ended up with the 6502 IP, even though like he, Jack Tremell, owned as part of Commodore MOS Technologies. And so he had a very unusual relationship to intellectual property. He had an unusual relationship to individual liberty, too, because here he is saying, as part of the philosophy, this is 85 at Atari, as part of the philosophy, um, he's not dictating to the user what they should do with their computer. That's a pretty hacker ethic, right? Um, and it's very different than, say, DRM, right, where you're dictating how and what terms that someone can use this media, right? Um, also, unrestricted access to computers. This is probably his most, um, one of his most well-known um, sayings. So as far as we are still selling products for the masses, it seems other companies only produce products for the classes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a real funny old quote. I like that quote because the, the, he had been using that line for so long. The interviewer just says, That's a real Tramo quote, isn't it? You know, it's like, OK, we've heard this plenty of times. But this idea of computers for the masses, not the classes, I mean, that is what propelled him to success, right? More than anything. And this idea that uh, you should have unrestricted access to computers. Um, now, why is that important? We'll get to that. But the fact is, the numbers bear out that Jack, over anybody, here's the Commodore 64 sales figures, over anybody before IBM came into the marketplace, spe specifically Apple, and specifically Sinclair and some of his greatest rivals, he's the guy that was able to first deliver mass market personal computers. And unlike IBM, who um, after Commodore was king for a few years, after IBM 
came in. Jack was still the person, or still the guy, that was delivering computers for the home, for the individual, right? And this is what I mean by that. It's important to think about the philosophy um, with this idea computers can change lives for the better because putting computers into the homes for kids and for families is a lot different than what IBM was doing when they were putting computers in the office and then trickling down from the office and eventually that stuff ended up in homes when it became cheap enough. But this is Jack in 1990 and um, at this time he had some sort of, I think he had a better understanding of uh, his place in history, so he started, he started revising maybe some of his motivation. And he said, when it comes to computers, I felt that it was the most important thing to be able to manufacture a computer which every kid in the world will be able to afford to buy. Before I had done this, the IBM and the DEX believed that computers were only for privileged people, emphasis his, which means that if you don't have $100,000, you couldn't buy it. And this emphasis not on the office, which Apple was always toying with, which of course um, drove IBM, um, was Jack. This was definitely his contribution and the push that he had in this idea, this hacker idea that computers can make lives better and then targeting the home instead of computers can make lives better and targeting the office. They're just completely different paradigms. And I think these are the reasons that Jack had so much success and had so much um, influence of, over uh, hacker culture, for example, um, young people. Now, placing these computers in the homes had a few consequences for Jack. Right? Those consequences, of course, were Commodore computer sales were up, up, up. Right? And computer sales in general were up, up, up. Right? Um, but Commodore, more than anybody, was selling lots of units. And with the sales going up, also carried the ideas of the computer into homes. So more computers were out there, and the philosophy of computerdom was carried into homes with it. For example, titles like this Commodore uh, 64 128 title called Hacker. Right? Uh, the last presenter showed war games, right? So hackers and the idea of hackers, even if they might have been perverted, even if it was different than what the MIT guys were doing, what the people out in uh, the Bay Area were working on and the philosophy and the ethics and the ethos that motivated them, even if it was different, it was still coming into homes. I mean, it was different partially because it had changed. A lot of those people were now making lots of money in the private sector and of course you have winners and losers and you have intellectual property concerns and you have management styles and all that. Also, Commodore modem sales were up, 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 right? This continues to spread the idea of hackers everywhere. Um, this is an ad from, um, from a magazine at the time and of course here's the War Games auto dialer, right? Inspired by War Games just to continue to dial numbers and try to find uh, places that would pick up your modem, right, and then eventually see if that system is vulnerable. Um, software protection handbook, top secret, cracking devices. You know, these were ads in magazines, and this was about spreading the idea that you should have unrestricted access, that information should be free, you should be able to do with the computer with what you want. You know, even if it's breaking the law, right, this is a legitimate ad in a legitimate computer magazine at the time. And so, the consequences were, as these ideas spread through the Commodore, through mainstream media and war games, uh, the movie and Whiz Kids, the television show in the early 80s, the co uh, Congress responded, and there is like, there's a bit of a panic, right, that all these young hackers are going to get into our systems and launch our nuclear missiles. We will have no control over what they will do with our computers. And so this Computer Fraud and Abuse Act which essentially was originally drafted, it was originally started in 84, right? Commodore was at its height. Um, it was finally passed and authorized in 86, right? And it has uh, two parts of it that are really bad to this day and really problematic. And that is the idea of 
authorization is murky, the word authorization, so you are not allowed to enter a computer system that you do not have authorization uh, to enter into, or you enter into an excess of that authorization that you have been granted. Which is a little straightforward, but the problem is, is in practice, it has just been word salad, and the United States government has applied it however they wanted. Because the, when the bill was drafted, it was drafted in fear of the hacker. It wasn't drafted to protect American citizens. It was drafted out of this panic, we have to do something about these hackers that are now taking over our computer systems, which was largely blown up you know, by the media. And then uh, penalties were very uh, disproportionate, like who got what penalty and how much. And of course, that we just saw that even recently, most famously with Aaron Schwartz. But these outsized penalties, or these penalties that are just irrational, one, one hacker gets this kind of time, another hacker gets years in jail and spends time, Kevin Mitnick famously spending so much time in solitary confinement. Right? The penalties are all over the place, too. So this law is a disaster, but it's, it's, it's that way because um, the rise of the PC was so quick and abrupt that the law was drafted essentially in haste. So that's sort of the parallel that I see with um, Jack Trumel and this accidental relationship he had with hackers. He, of course, is a pretty complicated figure, which makes him a pretty interesting figure. Uh, as I touched on before, a lot of people really uh, dislike Jack Tramiel. <laughs> a lot of people really like Jack Tramiel. Um, and I don't want to, uh, in this talk, kind of gloss over too much the fact that um, in the 1960s, Jack found himself in court. In the, in the 1980s, he found himself sued several times. In the 1990s, he was rather litigious uh, in the way he enforced Atari Corp intellectual property. These things are all uh, true and a matter of record. Um, but he was more than just an autocratic businessman. He was somebody that obviously achieved um, quite a bit, considering his roots, but more significantly than what he was able to achieve, he somehow ended up being in the right intersection at the right time, meaning that the values that Jack had, because he had already had a business uh, in typewriters. He already had a business in adding machines. He already had a business in calculators. But it was the personal computer, a technology that Jack might have understood the least, which brought him the most success. And a lot of that had to do with the world being ready for the kinds of uh, strategies that, and, the, and the personal beliefs that Jack employed, which is why he's such an important figure or an interesting figure to use as a parallel to the birth of the PC. Because here's a person in Wudge, Poland that, was, um, that suffered essentially the fiercest and the most uh, egregious use of centralized and um, machine-enforced, uh, bureaucratic, um, well, in his case, enslavement, right? Uh, because that network of camps, those were all, of course, um, centrally controlled and understood and monitored, you know, as well as you could with punch cards. But he understood uh, uh, viscerally the power that central control systems can have. And so he ended up um, essentially unwittingly to what I kind of think unwittingly, he essentially ended up um, working against central control and working uh, for individual empowerment his entire life. And I think the last time I talked to Leonard, his son, one of the things he said was, Jack still didn't believe that he was able to deliver the price point and the, the personal computer or the, the device, really, that was the fulfillment of that ideology. So he was still thinking about those things later on in life, and he was more willing to pontificate and talk about those things than he was when he was sort of like a corporate media baron, or a corporate um, uh, industry baron. So, okay, that's it. Uh, any questions about Jack? Covered a lot of ground. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs>